this is going to be strictly focused on that area of our, of our solution, but we're going to just briefly mention how it interrelates with other things that we do. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the benefits of automating irrigation control with telemetry. Then I'm going to talk about the technology architecture, you know, how that's built, what are the building blocks. And then we're going to turn to some customer examples and then finally to a fairly thorough software demonstration so that you can get a real sense for how this actually works. If you get a system like this, how is it going to, to look in the software side? If we talk about the benefits very briefly, um, we're looking at both labor savings, water savings, and energy savings. Uh, so there are multiple dimensions of, of benefits. The labor savings is, of course, that you don't have to go and manually operate all the valves. Uh, some people have manual irrigation timers, so they don't actually operate manually each valves. But even so, there's typically a lot of labor associated with driving to a site. Uh, that you may, uh, may, may be a remote site, you may not be actually based on that site. So some of the labor savings is actually drive time. Uh, so it's labor savings in the greatest sense of the word. It's labor including all the costs associated with labor to operate uh, valves uh, manually. There's also labor, labor associated with verifying that irrigation actually occurred. When you think about manually operated systems, it's not just a labor turning the valves on and off, it's also then running around trying to figure out if water is flowing in all places correctly at the, at the right rate. That's also automated by this system. So when you automate with a system like ours, it's not just the operation of the valves, but also the monitoring of what actually goes on. And that can not only be done without labor, but actually be done quite a bit better because of the nature of telemetry. We're going to show that. But the next level of benefit is obviously the water you save because you can use less water. Uh, one obvious way is to irrigate at night where there's less uh, evaporation, evaporation. The other way you save water is by detecting leaks quicker and shutting things off because you have better, in which entry you have better data about when things go wrong. And then you save water by you, since you know exactly how much you're putting on because you're measuring it now with flow meters and, and reporting that online, you get more comfortable putting only the water on you need rather than um, just putting putting on, uh, opening the valves and then uh, being on the safe side as many people put it, meaning typically that they over irrigate. This is especially true if you combine it with things like soil moistures and, and weather station components. Uh, you really get to a place where you are able to dial back the water to just what you need. And then thirdly, there's energy savings. Uh, the energy to pump water is very substantial in some places uh, where you irrigate. Uh, and energy costs are very time dependent. As you know, most, uh, most places energy costs a lot more during peak hours during the daytime. Uh, so in the morning when everyone gets out of bed is a time when many people turn on their pumps and start watering because that's, a, that's when the working day starts. Uh, in reality, you're much, much better off irrigating at night when the rates are very low. So you could cut your energy use, energy cost in half by remotely controlling the irrigation such that you can do it at night without having to have labor in the field at night. So. The architecture of a system like this looks uh, roughly like, like this slide. Um, the, the heart of most of these systems is a ranch systems base station. And in this case, you see it also duplicating as a weather station. That's very common. Um, but the base station functions as a hub for all the communications to the substations. And you see a substation out here. It's a node. In this case, it controls two valves. Uh, it also duplicates uh, as, a, as a camera node in this case, but that's just for illustration purposes of what's possible. Uh, out here, further out, you could have a node controlling a pump pumping out of a, of a reservoir, or it could monitor the water level in that reservoir, also sort of a 
feature that's associated with irrigation control because you obviously want to make sure that the pump is working uh, so you're not opening and closing the valves without the pump uh, operating as well. Attached to this node or maybe another node over here would be uh, flow meters monitoring the water flow in your irrigation lines. That's an important feedback that the system is actually working because you don't want to turn the valves on without knowing that you're getting flow. So another node could have a flow meter monitoring the flow from the valve or actuated by, by the node over here. A node could also have, as illustrated here, a soil moisture probe attached so that you know that the water is actually getting in the ground and that basically informs you as to when to irrigate and when to stop irrigating. Then again, you could have another node over here on the left side monitoring the water level in the tanks if you're pumping out of tanks. Uh, so you get the sense that you can connect all kinds of nodes wirelessly up through a base station here. And then, of course, people access this system via the Internet. Uh, you can see a person sitting in this house, one in the field with an iPad, one uh, you know, in a truck somewhere. Everything is tied together via the cellular network and back to uh, our software application which runs in two big data centers. Uh, we have actually three data centers where we operate servers for redundancy in Canada, Texas and, and uh, California. Um, this is a general overview. Each site is always a little bit unique. Some sites may be very large and need two base stations and multiple nodes. Some sites could be very small and everything could be wired to one, say, base station. So this is a general um, diagram illustrating a, a, a typical scenario, but every field is different and every system is typically customized to the unique, uh, unique situation. Some of the building blocks that we are using as we build these systems are the radio nodes here. There are really two types of nodes. There are the base station, which is a very substantial box here that is connected on one side to the cellular network, and the other side is talking to all the nodes in the fields. And nodes are what we see on the right side. Um, now there are two types of nodes. Uh, there are nodes that connect via a base station as we described here and as we saw in the previous picture, but there are also nodes that have a cellular antenna directly mounted on them and they can be used as, if you will, standalone nodes for places where you're out of reach of the base station, for example. But by and large, you typically have one base station and then you have a, a, a larger number of these uh, nodes and these nodes uh, connect typically to the valves and actuate the valves and that's all controlled uh, via the base station and ultimately via our server application. Now, these two radio nodes that I just described don't actually physically attach directly to the valves. You need some sort of expansion boards to sort of provide the physical electrical connection to your valves. And we have three options for that now. The, the one on the left here is an expansion board that actually fits inside our latest model of radio node, the RS300. And this is a, um, you know, basically provides you four DC latching outputs. And DC latching is, um, is a special type of solenoid. Uh, you typically use it with battery operated controllers. To, if you have some of these today, you would be able to use the same solenoids with uh, our DC latching output board. Uh, so basically what you what happens is that if you have an IS, sorry, IS 300 node like what, what I show on the right side here, this little expansion board would simply fit into this node in the bottom. There are pre-drilled holes. This would simply drop in there and you can even have two of these expansion boards for a total of eight uh, DC latching outputs. And then of course there's a plug with a cable that goes out uh, from this plug down to the actual valves. So with the IS300, our, our latest node product, you have eight of these output total possible with two expansion boards. Um, the IL200 controller here on the right side is, is a product that provides 12 outputs. 
The benefit there is that you have 12 outputs, which is more than you have over here. Uh, but you can also add multiple of these. We have customers running as much as three of these up to 36 outputs. And the other benefit is that they can be both DC latching or normally open switches. The normally open switches are used typically for 24 volt AC irrigation wiring, the, the sort of traditional irrigation wiring. So we are typically using the aisle 200 where you are replacing an existing irrigation timer. Let's say you have an existing irrigation timer with 24 volt AC and wiring going out to each valve. And then you typically have a large number of existing cables that go into your existing controller. Well, you can basically replace your existing controller with this IL200 and plug it into any of our radio nodes, and then it's a very direct switchover. Whereas the expansion board out here is typically used when you have more of a, a decentralized situation where uh, you have a radio node at each valve or each manifold, at least. The IX300 expansion box on the right side here is sort of a little bit of an in-between between these two other products. It's a product that provides four output terminals with DC latching or normally uh, open uh, switch outputs. Um, they have the benefit that they also have inputs. They also have four inputs, so they are used as a general sort of expansion if you say you needed more inputs as well as some outputs. Sometimes people have large number of flow meters or pressure sensors that are on a pump a pad uh, where they have a larger pump station. And they can use these IX300 boxes to route around a larger pump pad and pick up both flow meter inputs as well as control pumps or valves on, on a pump pad. And it's an IS45 connection that enables you to route wires fairly extensively 1,000 feet, as much as 1,000 feet away from the radio node. So we have, um, because of, of the number of years we've been doing this and the many different unique situations we've encountered, we have evolved this lineup of three different options. And I know it can be seem a little technical, which one should I use, but that's where we come in and advise you and your reseller will be advising you on exactly what is the best tool for your particular situation. Uh, I did mention this indirectly right now. I'm going to just describe a little bit more what I mean when I say a centralized setup versus a distributed setup. Because we typically see irrigation control falling into one of these two categories. Either people are upgrading from an existing sort of older irrigation clock or timer uh, where they already have the wiring routed to one point you typically have a 24 volt AC power supply, and it's a matter of simply dropping in our L200 product that I described before, one or more of those, to pick up all those existing wiring and cabling in one place, and then typically only one base station or cell node is required right there to control that. Now that's also, of course, the least expensive uh, system by far because you're taking advantage of your existing wiring. In some cases, people have uh, two wire systems in their in their existing uh, solution, oh, but meaning there's one uh, set of two wires uh, trenched around the, the field, picking up all the valves. And in that case, we simply integrate our IL200 into that two wire controller. Uh, that's also something that we've done in several places. The other architecture is a distributed architecture. This is typically when we are doing a complete green field, new installation where there's no prior automation. You typically just have manifolds distributed throughout your fields with manual valves, and you basically are typically not interested in trenching a wire back to a central point that's prohibitively expensive. And so in that case, you drop one of our wireless nodes in at each location where you have a manifold. You, you equip the manifold with nine or 12 volt DC latching valves. That's a standard product from, from almost any valve manufacturer. Uh, and then you control those from our radio node and the whole thing is wirelessly connected together to a base station. So you'd have in that case base station and multiple telemetry nodes. And of course this is a more expensive system because you now have a, a, a radio node at each manifold but it's typically a lot less expensive than if you had to trench 
a whole new um, wiring system down the ground. So just giving you some uh, visuals, some pictures, um, a, a distributed system uh, with DC latching valves might look like this. You have a manifold, two different types of manifold illustrated here, and you have a radio node placed uh, right by that and your wires going down to the valves. In this case, uh, you may be able to see very vaguely, I mean it's probably too hard for you to see on the presentation there, but there are little flow meters in the drip lines here. And so this radio node would not only control the valve, and there's actually two valves, in one in each direction, but it also picks up a signal from little flow meters that we, that we put in line with the drip line. And those flow meters are important because they provide us the positive feedback that water is actually flowing. And we're going to get into that when we demonstrate the software, how we manage that. But it's very important when you automate, of course, that you can detect any mistakes, anything that's not occurring as, as planned. And having little flow meters in line is a, is a great way of doing that. Either flow meters or pressure sensors. Some way of positively verifying that the valve actually turned on. Conversely, here's a centralized valve control setup where you have a base station here and then you got a R200 controller and then in this case it actually is a two-wire system so you have a two-wire system connecting into the IL200 and then all control from the base station. It's confusing perhaps that the IL200 uses the same enclosure as the base station uh, but this is in fact a, a wireless unit going back to to our servers via the cell network and this is in fact uh, the relay controller that I talked about before with a wire connected up to the base station. And then there's wiring behind here over to this universal controller, uh, which is again wiring then goes from here out to the um, via the two wire system uh, throughout the field. Here's another example of a, a distributed system. You have a radio node controlling a a fairly large DC latching valve here. This is also to illustrate that DC latching mm -hmm. uh, valves come in, in, in all sizes. Um, and, and some people wonder, yeah, with a little DC signal, can I open a huge 12-inch line valve? Yes, it doesn't make any difference because the actual energy to open and operate the valve is actually provided by the water pressure. The solenoid and, and the signal we give is actually just a little poke, <laughs> so to speak, uh, and that is actually the same energy required by our system, whether it's a 12-inch line or it's a 1-inch line, because the water pressure is, is how the, the energy is provided. So it also follows that this system will not work with non-pressurized lines, um, but uh, you know, so, so you couldn't, for instance, put one of these valves right up by a tank and open and close up. Let's say you have a gravi gravity fed system, you have to put the valve, this valve downstream, down by the field, you couldn't put it up at the tank because if it's a gravity fed system up at the tank, there wouldn't be any pressure and this, this valve wouldn't work. And it's just a little side, side note there. The other thing we illustrate in this picture is that uh, we have a radiation shield here. So this node is also acting as a, as a mini weather station. And so this is actually an important point because once you make the investment in a distributed valve control system, you get the benefit of very little additional cost of getting a microclimate system measuring and monitoring your climate at each of these valve locations. You could also put a camera on any of these units. Then you get a camera monitoring system or maybe just one location you want a camera as well. Uh, you could also put a soil probe on this system at the same time, then you get soil moisture. And, and again, because these nodes are very, very capable and can, one node can operate a valve, have a camera, have a weather station, and a soil probe. All, all at the same time, it's pretty uh, amazing and that multi-capability makes the incremental cost of adding all of these extra features and functionality quite low once you've made your initial investment in, in sort of the network. 
So here's just some other examples of what you might have. You might have a pump station somewhere where you have uh, obviously the pump, but here's a flow meter over here. You might have a water level in this tank all wired together, with, which we have in this case to this node. So we monitor the flow and the, um, and the water level in the tank. Over here we have a filter station where a node is monitoring pressure on each side of the filter. Enable us to monitor backflow, uh, backflush performance of this filter. Make sure the filter is basically not clogged. Then we monitor all kinds of uh, pump stations. Here is a node monitoring a, a fairly small pump station, turning it on and off. Versus over here, you see a base station controlling a large John Deere uh, diesel uh, diesel pump out of a out of a reservoir, out of a canal, actually. So just to give you a sense of the breadth of equipment that we can control with our system. Tanks, very popular to monitor tanks. Uh, we have water level sensor that you just drop inside the tank. Can canals, ponds of various sizes. Mm -hmm. Here's actually on the right side you see a, a node with a submersible water level sensor going into the pond in a uh, protective PVC flexible uh, conduit. So I'm going to turn over now to more of the customer side of things uh, before we go into the software presentation. I just want to give you an update. People are always ask, you know, how, how many people are using this. Today we are deployed in all major continents with this technology. US, South America, Canada, Australia, and Europe, multiple systems in all of these continents. Our adoption status right now is that we are pretty close to 500 installations, uh, close to 1,000 users. We have 62 of those at last count that are doing control, which is the more advanced stuff where you're actually controlling some sort of equipment. And these numbers are not counting hundreds of OEM installations, which are uh, other companies using our technology under their own brand. That's not counted in, in these numbers. So we actually feel that uh, if you take the kind of system we're talking about here with sophisticated internet-based uh, valve control in coordination with all of these other features, soil moisture, weather stations, and so on and so forth, we don't know of any other technology today deployed in, 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 in worldwide that has the same kind of adoption. So we're very, uh, we're very uh, happy about that. Uh, um, uh, Jacob, uh, before yeah. going on, uh, uh, let's just pause for, for a, a couple minutes. Uh, I don't see any questions, but uh, if anybody uh, has their, uh, any questions at this point, uh, type them in and uh, we'll uh, uh, address them before uh, going on and uh, kind of digging in and uh, taking you for a, uh, for a drive in the, in the software. Thanks for jumping in there, Mike. Uh, it's a good, uh, we're almost at the half, halfway point, so um, Please let me know if there are any questions to the fundamental technology uh, in the field side because we're going to turn more now towards uh, some customer examples and the software. So any, anything on sort of the hardware architecture side is, is good to, to jump in with now. Well, apparently you're being very eloquent uh, today because uh, we just got a comment that says we understand everything. <laughs> oh, good. That's, uh, that's best, we can, best we can hope for. So. I wanted to share a few ROI analysis we did a few years back actually, but they are still just as good. Um, one is from Obsidian Ridge Vineyards uh, up, up north here in, in California. Um, they basically use in the classic set of solution that I've been describing here. Um, I don't want to go through it in detail in the interest of time because you can revisit this uh, on, online later, but it does show that a system that costs about 16k and 184 dollars a month to operate uh, had a nine-month payback period based on labor savings, water use efficiency, and energy cost by by um, you're getting a bite. And also spray cycle saving. This has to do with the weather, the microclimate capability because they build out a, a valve control system. They also got this microclimate system almost for free as part of that. And that saves a spray cycle a year on average, which is very expensive. 
Another example is a waste remediation project uh, where they have a, a very large amount of uh, trees on the site where they are using soil probes to monitor the water and they are using our irrigation control to control that entire system. It was a more expensive system, cost $114 a month to operate and payback there based on, again, labor management on, on site because uh, there's no one actually on site, they have to travel there. Uh, adds up very quickly and again it's a it's, it's 12 month payback. And then uh, the last one is actually the Sonterra Vineyards which is uh, a great example because this is the kind of site where people would sometimes say well uh, it's a it's a private owner, it's a relatively small site, 11 acres, so is it really necessary to automate something where you could really, you don't necessarily count your own time as a private owner, you know, why don't I just walk around and, and do it myself. The reality is, in this case, the, the owner is actually not nearby, he's not on site, uh, you know, he's nearby, he could drive there, but he's not actually living right on site, so there's a travel time every time involved. But the biggest benefit for this owner is actually the unquantifiable improvement in his uh, lifestyle and peace of mind. I mean, he feels now that he actually knows how much water he's getting on, that there is a, a control of uh, the, the, the plan versus execution. There is now a very clear link. We are planning to irrigate this way, this regime to make uh, the very best grapes. We don't want to over irrigate, we don't want to under irrigate. And we now have a confidence that that's actually being executed and we have the, the documents to show that that's being executed along those lines. Uh, in this case, they're selling the grapes to high-end wineries and, and this is also part of what is valuable documentation to those uh, people buying the fruit that this is actually fruit generated within that parameters of not over irrigating or under irrigating. So although the economic payback is 30 months, which is longer than the other cases I showed you. Um, it's still a very good payback, but, but on top of that payback is just all the unquantifiable improvements in food quality and the owner's uh, peace of mind. Uh, Jacob, there's a, a question that came in I think that's relevant. Uh, yeah. Uh, it relates to the ongoing costs. And uh, mm -hmm. could you describe what, uh, what, uh, what those ongoing costs consist of? Good, good question. The ongoing costs are basically the, the, the fees for operating our service and that includes the cellular transmission cost, of course, there has to be a cellular connection from the field and then the cost of our software. That's all charged as one monthly service fee or annual service fee depending on how people choose to pay. So that's basically that, that fee we are talking about there. Now, there are obviously other operational costs that you still have um, which are not mentioned here. I'm simply saying the ranch system solution costs this much and the ongoing cost of maintaining it with the ranch systems, our monthly service fee is this much. So I should have maybe clarified that. So moving on to the software demonstration. Uh, we're going to stay with Sonaterra here. Um, we're going to go into showing how we can monitor irrigation, how we can schedule it, uh, error detection and alerting around that. We're going to show a little bit of the advanced rules we can set up to detect the leak and shut the pump off. And we are also going to just briefly look at some, uh, some of the reporting options. Uh, so with that, let me try and switch over to to my web browser. So the web is obviously all completely uh, web driven. So I type in Sonaterra, that's the name of my property. This is my individual username and then um, we're going to provide a password. So the first thing that will come up is a dashboard. And uh, I'm not going to go too much into that because the dashboard is typically used primarily for the um, weather station components that you're monitoring here, temperature, humidity, and so on and so forth. All those 
the com it's very configurable. So people typically put things in here as well related to the irrigation flow, uh, the pump pressure. For instance, you can click on irrigation flow and you will see the aggregate irrigation flows, and you can see we were irrigating on the 20th and the 22nd. So it's helpful to go in and in a, in a quick flash look at is there any irrigation flow right now on my property. Now it doesn't show you which block and so on and so forth without clicking, but you get a quick look here. Is there any irrigation flow? And if you feel there shouldn't be, then of course that's an immediate red flag. You can also see the pump here. It's a variable speed drive. That, so that keeps the system pressurized. You can see I have a 43 PSI right now. Uh, but by and large, the dashboard is, is more used for things like degree days, milieu index, and some of those things that are more uh, maybe climate related or, or soil moisture related. When you talk about irrigation control, you typically drop into the map, the real time map. And that's why I'm going to click on here in the middle of the screen. Because that gives us another level of detail that we typically want when we are looking at irrigation control. So what this is is a is a layout that shows the uh, the site. In this case, it's sort of a Google map that has been uh, imported into our application as a base image, we call it. And then on top of that, we have uh, defined the specific irrigation control zones. That's the green outlines that you see here. And we have a block one down here, a block two here, block three, block four, and block five. And then we have a frost zone down here that is uh, sequestered because of the frost risk out here. Now, what we do is we assign different control nodes to, to control these different zones. As, as you see here, if I zoom in a little bit, maybe it's easier. What's happening in this particular site is that in block one down here, Sometimes we call it zones, sometimes we call it blocks. It's the same thing. In block one, we have a node, a radio node out here called 2020. Let's see if I can make it a little bit larger. The radio node uh, 2020, which you see on the right side here, is controlling both block one and block two. There's actually, uh, it's located right here, and there's a manifold right here controlling these two blocks. And there's also flow meters in each direction for these two blocks. And so what we do is we, we draw it as a block here because all of this block is controlled by this node. And then we, we have indicated here in the middle the valve and the flow meter is shown right here in the middle. So if I enlarge this a little bit, you can see here is indicated the uh, valve and the current status of that valve and the flow meter. If I actually click on this, you would see if that valve had been actuated. Now, we're not irrigating in this particular block right now on this side, so I'm actually going to go up to another block called Old Olives up here. You can see this is a little, it's, it's a block off to the side. It's actually an olive grove that lines the driveway coming up to the property, and that's where they start irrigating the earliest. So what you see here is an example of what happens when I click on that. I get an overview of the olive block and the irrigation that's been going on here over the last couple of days. You can see that on the 22nd here in the, at 6 o'clock in the morning, we turned on the valve, that's the bottom graph, and we got two and a half gallons per minute of flow. Uh, it's relatively small flow, you might say, but that's because it's only in one drip line. So we only monitor we have a little flow meter that's only in one grid line, so it's not indicative of the flow in the whole block. It's just what's sitting right after that particular, in that particular drip line uh, where we have the flow meter. We can go out and say maybe take last week and see what we've been doing over the last week. You can see that we have had a couple of irrigations over the last week. You can, we put in here the, the water, uh, the, sorry, the temperature in the top graph. You can configure these graphs actually as you like by assigning different sensors to the zone. Some people put soil moisture up here if they have it. Uh, ET, if they calculate that via soil radiation, anything can be up here. And that gives you a little bit of context for irrigation when you look at it in a multi-week multi view. But what this first and foremost tells you is if you're sitting 
an off-site and you're looking at this, it tells you that the valve opened, the flow occurred, the flow is the right level, you get a sense of comfort that this actually occurred as planned. And, and you're actually getting a better confirmation of what happened on this site than if you had been there yourself. That's really the key point. Um, now, you can click around in the different blocks, uh, but what you know, I want to show up here is a pump station. We, we, these are obviously the consumers of water, these blocks, the old olives and the block one, two, three, four. But where does the water come from? Well, it comes from the pump station. So I've created a little zone up here for the pump station, and I can click in that as well. And that gives me a graph that indicates what's going on in the pump station. And what you're seeing here is the pressure variation out of the VFD drive. You can see that it settles down around 70. And then when we actually irrigate, like on the 22nd, um, we uh, see you know, you know, an interesting picture where we get the aggregate water flow. And that's because now we have the pump station. We actually get the flow out of the main line, and that's obviously closer to you know 100 gallons per minute, even though we only have two and a half gallons out in the in that drip line we were monitoring. We can also see that there are some. Uh, we can see the VFD keeping up and and adjusting pressure. That's something we'd like to to monitor that our VFD uh, pump is working. You can see an example here where uh, probably we irrigated two blocks at this point. Something else was opened. I actually am not. You're sure what other block was open temporarily there. They are testing the system in, in, in anticipation of the irrigation season here. So probably another block were, were open for a brief period of time here. And you can see the aggregate flows jumps to 400 gallons per minute. And you can see the VFD drive actually struggling to keep up. It drops down to 40 PSI. Again, these are the kinds of things that I hope you get a sense that you actually get much more information from this system off-site than if you were on-site running around trying to find out what was actually going on with your system. So, oops. let's see here, close that window. So we're not going to go into some of the other features and functionality that we have on site. I mean, we do have, as you can see here, soil moisture sensors. That's a whole topic on its own, right? Mark Greenspan had a great uh, webinar with us uh, a week ago or two that, that went into that. Hopefully you saw that. Uh, we also have cameras on site. I wanted to just bring it up because it's, it's, a, it's such a cool, cool feature. You can go in on any day in the past here and say, on the let's say on the 22nd when we were irrigating the old olives, what did it actually look like in the in the in the field? Here we have those pictures. So some people actually put these cameras onto the pump station uh, because what they are while we are here we are monitoring the canopy. Some people are using the cameras to monitor uh, if someone is accessing the pump station, if someone is on site, if someone is on site when they shouldn't be. That can be just another component of a complete irrigation control system uh, where you want the visual confirmation as well. Other people have used this for uh, tanks that don't have automatic water level uh, sensors but, uh, or reservoirs where you don't have automatic water level sensing but where you might have the manual gauge on the side of the tank which is just a sliding PVC rule. Uh, you put a camera on and that's a very simple way of seeing how much water is in your tank or pointing it at a reservoir is a very simple way of see, seeing how much water is in a reservoir or a canal. So with that, <clears throat> that was a little bit of a detour. Uh, what I wanted to go back to is, of course, our irrigation control here. The next thing we're going to look at is how do we schedule these irrigations. You have seen here how we monitor the irrigation. Some people in fact start by just implementing monitoring because that in itself is a, is a very substantial value. But how, how do you automatically schedule this? You go into a tab over here on the left side called irrigation schedules. <clears throat> and here you see a, um, an, an, a screen that has several components to it. 
the core component is essentially a calendar. What you have here along along here is a set of uh, a week. This is Monday. Is actually Tuesday, Thursday is today, and then through to next Wednesday. So it basically starts out showing you the following week from now, and then down the left side here you have the different irrigation blocks: block one, two, three, four, five, and then you in the old hours. And then also well shutdowns, which you may you may wonder why is that there. I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But basically the, the blocks are lined up here and you can see that the irrigation has been scheduled for 10 o'clock. I'm going to zoom in a little bit on this uh, to enable you to, to see it maybe a little bit closer up. You can see here is uh, irrigation scheduled at 10 o'clock for 120 minutes and uh, at 6 o'clock for 480 minutes, which is uh, 8 hours and 2 hours respectively. And I'm going to show you how we can add another irrigation. Let's say on Saturday I wanted to irrigate um, one of my grape blocks. The grape, which is block one to five, I'm actually not being irrigated yet on this side, so that's why you don't see anything. But let's say I wanted to, to just test my block one and say at uh, 14 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon, let, let's give this uh, 60 minutes of water. I just type that right in there and I click Save. And now that is going to be scheduled. That's it. That's all I need to do to schedule an irrigation. It's typed in. It's 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 locked into the system. I can modify it all the way up till 30 minutes before. 30 minutes before, you know, two o'clock on Saturday, it's going to lock it in, transmit it down to the system, and be ready down on the site for for irrigation. Um, if I need to do more than one thing at a day, I click Add Line out here on the right side, and I could go again at 1,800 hours, another 60 minutes, and so on and so forth. I can add as many irrigation lines per day as I like. It's also equally easy to delete them. I just click on the little trash can there. Boom, it's gone. Now. It is obviously um, you know, cumbersome if you have a complicated system to irrigate and to enter all these irrigations manually. So what you get into very quickly is our irrigation program feature. And up here on the right side, you will see the irrigation program uh, block. And what that enables me to do is select between programs. In this case, we have an olives in the spring program and a grapes at regular ET programs. These are uh, the two programs currently used, and what, what the way it works is basically this is a set of pre-programmed irrigations, and, and we're going to try this out by simply saying, what if we wanted to apply all of the irrigation on Saturday and Sunday, for example? Well, then I would just go in and and say basically on Saturday uh, and Sunday. I basically would like um, to get the olive irrigation applied. Let's do it. Confirm. Boom. Now suddenly you will see that I have, uh, well actually the way it works is it goes, you know, I have to go 24 through 26, meaning it, it, it goes on the 24th and the 25th and, and st stopping at 26 midnight. So that's why if I actually wanted Saturday and Sunday, I would actually have done uh, like, like this. Do that again. Okay, so now I have it on Saturday and Sunday. Now, I can now remove that program again. I can go in here and say remove. Then it's removed, and I've removed that day's irrigations. Now I, I accidentally strayed into Monday where there was an irrigation schedule, and so they were removed as well. But I can just go back in here and say Monday, where we have Monday here, boom, and apply that program. Now this Monday program is back that I had before. But so Hopefully this illustrates that I can simply apply a program. Let, let's let's try even something like grapes. Let's go in and put the grape program on from the 25th uh, on to the throughout 28. Apply the grape program. 
boom, you see how suddenly all my grape zones here got a program, and you can see this program actually has multiple cycles per per block. I'm doing a pulse deagation with uh, you know, 30 minutes with with uh, 15 minutes of pausing between. So you, what you saw here is uh, basically the regular ET grape grapevine program for block one through four. And you saw how that actually multiple lines per block, and they just got added to the right like that. And I can I can remove them again. Boom. And there we go. So it's very easy to once you've defined your programs and got everything set up, applying a program, removing programs, adjusting programs is actually very easy. You can also apply the grapevine program again and then say I want to actually dial back to 50% of normal. I just want to 50% of my my regular program applied. Then you go in and here and see that all the 30 minutes are now 15 minutes. So now I basically took an existing program and I just had the system essentially do it at 50% water budget. So I don't have to create a new program for every little variation. I can create some core programs and then I can throttle them with my budget number here between, you know, I can also go above budget. I could do 120% budget. So let me uh, remove this again. How do we create these programs? That's done in edit programs. I'll just briefly show you that. Uh, for example, here we have our regular ET program. I'm going to click on that. And as you can see here, basically I have all my blocks down here. I have all my my uh, program instructions here. In this case, I'm starting at, at midnight doing three cycles in block one. Each cycle should be 30 minutes and the pause between each cycle should be 15 minutes. It will show me here, it calculate for me that adds up to a total of 90 minutes of irrigation, but it's going to not be done until 2 o'clock and that's because of my pause, of course. And then I can pick up at 2 o'clock with my next block, uh, cycle it as well. Uh, down here I have another one, block 3, I'm doing 45 minutes and only 10 minutes pause. That could be because I have a different soil type there, I just chose to do a different cycling in that block. So that's the irrigation program feature. I can also take my regular ET program, for instance, and create a copy. Let's say I wanted to, to create a regular, let's say I wanted to do one for high ET. I, all I did is I used the copy button. I created a copy of this and I could just go in and say my, my, my high ET should be, uh, should be 45 minutes and 60 minutes in this other block. And I've created more of a high ET kind of program and I save that. So now I have a high ET and a regular ET. And when I go back into my irrigation schedule, you'll see now I have that extra program. And you saw how quick that was to create a new program by just copying another program and making whatever modifications I want. And now I could go in, of course, and apply my high ET program right off the bat here on those days. And you will see that they are now I still have the 50% budget. Maybe I should actually do it with, let me do it with 100% budget. Good. So now you can see I have my high ET program applied with 45 minutes and 60 minutes in block three. So very easy to uh, create, manage, uh, apply, and remove programs. You can also overlay program, so you apply one program first and then you fill in with another program and that's sort of overlaid on the other program. Um, but uh, those are techniques you become familiar with once you, uh, once you uh, get, get, uh, get going and using the system. There are also some other things I wanted to um, point out. What we've looked at here is how we schedule irrigation. What happens with irrigation as it, as it actually executes and how do I know if that is actually going as planned? Well, that's easily illustrated by going back and selecting. Up here I can select different views and let me go back in time. Let me go back to the beginning of this week and show you what it looks like. In this case you see something different. You see that in the past, of course, I can't change the irrigation time, but I see the actual irrigation that was programmed 
and equally important, I see a icon afterwards that says that this irrigation is complete and the sense of verification passed. It's, it's a check mark with a circle around. That is basically the system has done the analysis on the data to verify that that actually was a good irrigation. And, and to illustrate how it did that, we, you can click on this icon. So this was 10 o'clock on Monday for two hours. It will bring up the actual underlying data for that particular irrigation. Uh, and as you can see, uh, it will show at the bottom that the valve was fired at 10 o'clock, but it wasn't actually exactly 10 o'clock. As you see by mousing over here, it was actually 12 minutes past, or 12 seconds past 10 o'clock. And I mention that only to illustrate that the system isn't just sort of putting, putting the scheduled time in here. This is not the exact time you put in your schedule. This is the actual time verified via the wireless system that the solenoid was actuated. And again, the feedback is from the flow meter in that block, and that shows uh, five minutes past. So it's actually five minutes past 10 o'clock before we verify the, the flow. But that's still pretty good because you have some line filling time on a, on a, on a drip system. Uh, Jacob, um, yeah. uh, I think a, a good question came in. And uh, um, it's uh, essentially um, how can irrigation be uh, triggered by uh, uh, sensor events like uh, soil moisture data or maybe uh, uh, a heat alert or something like that? Would you uh, yeah. describe that? Yeah, uh, I'm actually going to describe that under the advanced rules section right when we're done with this. So if you bear with me for just um, finishing up this segment, then we will get into the rules part of the software where we can set both things up. Um, so this is basically the feedback monitoring and up here you have some timestamps that help you understand exactly how the system verified and, uh, and confirmed irrigation events. Now I did want to show uh, what does this look like. It looks like it just always puts a check mark but to illustrate that this system actually sometimes uh, show you other stuff I want to go back to the week prior to this. This is actually the week when we were testing this system out here. We were doing what we call our annual service at this site, working with the owner to make sure that the whole system is, is ready for the irrigation season. And as you can see from this screen, that picked up various malfunctions. Um, for example, down here, uh, this node was uh, out for service in the morning. It was being serviced while we were testing. So this, this irrigation at 10 o'clock was actually missed. It was a test irrigation. Uh, and if you click on this one, you'll see that there's no data in the graph. So there was just no, the node was not even present at that, at that time. And so the important thing to note is that even though this was scheduled, if it does not happen, then this will be very, very much detected by the system and the owner and the operator of the system will get an email alert and a text message alert about this event that went wrong. And there's a record in here where you can go in at a glance and see what failed. And at, at 3 o'clock this node was redeployed and the irrigation went, went uh, ahead as planned and there was a check mark with a green uh, icon. Uh, there's also another one here where it is a question mark. The question mark is a little bit different. In this case, the radio node actually confirmed that the, the solenoid was actuated, but there's no feedback registered. There's no flow registered. So that's not quite as bad because actually the valve is probably opened and, and it's quite possible that everything was okay, but we didn't get the positive feedback. So for those cases, you will see question mark. Well, again, at a glance, you can go in and see how your system is working, what's, uh, what failures there were, if any, and then address those. It also points to the, to the whole issue of being able to focus your labor and those, those people you have looking after your irrigation system. This system lets you pinpoint where are the problems and have people work on the things that are actually needing attention rather than uh, waste time running around checking things that are working just fine. That, that, that's pretty significant uh, benefit, especially in larger systems. Now, 
I did want to go in and address the question uh, just now about uh, how can we trigger irrigations based on, on other events. So let me go into the rules and alerts section and show what they have here. It's not exactly what, the, what you asked about, but in this case uh, they actually have the opposite question of saying how can we shut something off if we detect a leak. And I'll then show you how that could be used for starting irrigation as well. But the concept of rules and alerts is basically that you can describe a magmatic condition, so to speak, on any sensor in the system. So if this sensor is higher than that or this sensor lower than that, then do something. And in this case we have a, a rule here that's called a pump leak detection off. And uh, But it basically is a little bit nebulous, but it basically and I, I won't go in today into the actual syntax of our little programming language here because it gets a little bit too involved, but there's basically a way here of saying uh, if, if, no, if no valves are on, is basically what this is, this last value uh, formula here will basically aggregate all of the different valves and say if none of them are on, and then it will check a flow meter. This is actually a, the sum here is the sum of water flowing out of the main flow meter. Uh, if that's higher than 200 gallons, then do uh, a switch off in this case. So basically the rule here is if no valves on and the flow out of the main flow meter is larger than 200 gallons aggregate, then we have a problem because the water is flow not flowing out through uh, the valve that they should. We consider that a leak and we do a switch off action here and we indicate this is the code for that relay that's basically the ID identifier for that relay controlling the pump and it's basically the net effect of creating this rule is that under that condition the, the pump is shut off. But as you can see you can also switch something on or you can send an email alert, text message alert or even call phone lines and leave voice messages based on any of these conditions. So in, in to your question you could have a rule that uh, went in and said if soil moisture and there would be a, basically a formula for picking up the soil moisture sensor, that each sensor has a code, you basically say if the last value of the soil moisture sensor was below this, then switch on a particular valve and that would typically be the valve that is in the block. Uh, that you are that you have a soil moisture sensor and you would assign of course each soil moisture sensor to each valve and you could set up a system that would irrigate based on soil moisture. But you could do even better than that actually because we have something called virtual sensors and virtual sensors are really uh, again the whole subject unto itself but virtual sensors is a concept where you can define a sensor that's calculated based on a bunch of other sensors. So what you might do is you might do a root sum of your soil moisture sensor where you average based on where your root system is, you, you concentrate and synthesize into one single number that's sort of the, the, the inch of water in your soil profile is how some people think about it. What's the total water sum in my profile right now? And then you can make the rule depending on that root sum of water in your soil profile rather than a particular individual sensor. And then, of course, there are ways to calculate plant available moisture by, by taking soil type into consideration. Depending on how sophisticated you want to get, you can put all of that into virtual sensors and then use that virtual sensor as the trigger of your rule. I hope that answers the question. Uh, please type, type in any if you need, need any more clarification on that point. Um, we're coming up on uh, on the hour. In fact, we were already there. I just wanted to show also a little bit of uh, reporting. If you go into the export tab here, um, you can create all kinds of reports. We have reports for for you know, weather and rainfall, and of course, also typically for an irrigation system, the daily flow totals. With the increase in, in demand for reporting of, of water applied, the daily flow total report is, is very important. That's essentially typically what you would submit uh, straight to your uh, controlling agency 
for documenting how much water you're using. A lot of people here in California certainly are under those restrictions uh, 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 increasingly. So you type in your date interval here. Um, I'm, I'm sharing a report from July to September last year. It will generate all of that data in that report and uh, then uh, it's going to be ready for download here. Boom. Going to open that up and then you can see say August last year, you can see for each block exactly for each day how many gallons of water were applied and how does that total up. So that's uh, probably our most uh, popular report related, related to irrigation, but our system is, is very um, configurable when it comes to uh, uh, reports. As you can see here, but again that's a whole different uh, uh, webinar you can go in and create uh, reports that are uh, in PDF form as we saw here, but you could also create them so that they have uh, Excel a spreadsheet layout. You could create them so that they compare ET to, to water use per week, for example, and, and create a report that shows that. You could furthermore take any report that you create and set up an automatic execution of that report every morning and, and automatic emailing of that report to, to your irrigator uh, or every week. So all of these reports are not only very customizable, but they are also auto-executable and distributable via email to people. Uh, so once you get all of this set up, you can create a, a very highly tuned uh, system to completely automate and monitor your irrigation system. So at this point, I think that I covered the main points that I, I, I wanted to cover today. I think Q&A is probably uh, in order here. Um, would love to, to get some, uh, some questions in, in, in any of, of all what we've talked about here. So we, uh, well, uh, let's see if there's more questions coming in, but we do, we do have one um, uh, related to, to a kind of a ongoing costs. Yeah. Uh, approximately what percentage of base costs would be needed to be spent in order to maintain replacing equipment as it ages and gets damaged? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, we have seen great, vari great variance in that um, because it seems like some sites are much harder on our equipment than other sites. Um, I'll just give you an example. There are sites where there's a lot of machinery operation and routinely equipment gets damaged and needs replacement. And so in, in an environment where that is the case, you know, obviously you want to train your machine operators to avoid that and, and, and manage that cost, but there are sites where you have that kind of problem driving cost, but assuming that you sort of dial it in so you don't have any of those kind of uh, controllable incidents, um, our systems have, I would say, a similar lifetime as other you know, real assets is anywhere from, from five to ten years. I mean, it doesn't mean that they don't run after ten years, but then the technology, you know, is probably you know, run its, its course and you're going to want to make a, a reinvestment. So I would depreciate these systems over, you know, maybe a five-year period and then you probably get more years out of it after that. Uh, now, in reality, that's just sort of an economic and accounting rule in reality, what you will then probably do is you will do little upgrades and little maintenance every year. And so in reality, it's not like you would discard the system after five to ten years. You would actually effectively do 10 to 20 percent uh, improvements and upgrades and maintenance every year, just, just as, a, as a rule of thumb. Okay. Um, here's a question about fertigation. Uh, can we create a program to add liquid fertilizer to the irrigation system? Also, where we can see how many gallons did we spend on the specific period of time? Okay, so in fertigation, actually, that was something I failed to talk about because in the irrigation schedules here, what I wanted to show before is that the irrigation schedules can have 
of course, what I would call the regular block valves. These are valves that, that are corresponding to actual irrigation blocks. But you can also have other, va other valves in there. And in this case, we have a shutdown switch. But where we do fertigation, what you will see added down here are the fertigation valves for the different um, materials that you, that you inject. And so there's nothing to prevent you in a program and this is how people do it when we do fertigation. They would create a, they would take, take for instance, the Graves High ET or regular ET program. Let me actually do it right now. And then they would go in and modify it and call it uh, Graves Fertigation. And then what they would do is they would have their regular at, 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 at midnight valve one is, is, um, is being uh, irrigated and then what they would do is they would create a line down here where you would have a fertigation valve here it's not in this system but, but if you had a fertigation valve here I would just add a, a cycle here on maybe only um, this could be say five minutes with five minutes pauses depending on how I want to dose it out so I'd calculate based on based on how much that injector valve gives me I would calculate how many minutes I need to to put on, and let's say I did, I might even do five cycles. Then I get 25 minutes total fertigation in this block, but I get it meted out, I get it spoon fed out with five minutes and five minutes pulsing, and all of that will terminate at 0:45. I get that help here, and I know that would be, you know, well within my irrigation cycle here. And actually, what I probably do in the fertigation program, I would just go in and call this 45 minutes uh, and in this case I wouldn't have any pauses. Then my my water program up here would, would, would run just 45 minutes. I would apply water for 45 minutes. And maybe I would even do 15 minutes after my last fertigation. Say now I have one, uh, one hour of water. And then I have a pulse sort of spoon fed fertigation program adding up to 25 minutes of delivery spread out with five minutes pauses adding up to a total of 45 minutes of time and then I have 15 minutes of sort of w washing uh, time uh, you know where I'm adding water without fertigation after that. So that would be an example of how you dial in your fertigation programs and add them to the mix. Uh, and then you can create as many different profiles as you as you want. Again each profile of fertigation would just be a different program where you combine the, the blocks with uh, s additional actuation of these fertigation valves. And, and you can add more lines to the program, by the way. So if you wanted to add another, the fertigation valve can appear twice in the program. So if you wanted to then apply uh, fertigation again at, let's say, 2 o'clock, you just add another line and then you, you run that fertigation valve again, but matching it up with the other irrigation. So um, good. Hopefully that's clear. I hope you type in any any question for for Mike if this is not not clear. Yeah, kind of a, a, a diversion away from uh, fertigation. Uh, the um, question is: uh, Have any of your existing customers had issues with theft? Yes. Um, so theft is, I, mean, I, I would have to say, surprisingly very little because you would think that with thousands of units sold and deployed, uh, you know, I assume that most units would be replaced if they are stolen. And I, I have a hard time even remembering any incident of theft. I, I think we have had a few, but I think it is surprisingly little. And I think it has to do with the fact that um, the unit is really not usable, obviously, by anyone stealing it. Um, so, so our equipment is we will be deactivated as soon as it's stolen. So no one will have any benefit of it. It's a little bit like a cell phone. People tend to not steal cell phones because they know they they won't work at the moment they steal them. So in terms of our equipment, I don't think there's any theft risk really. Uh, if you are talking about theft in terms of theft on, on the site and using our system to monitor it with cameras, that's obviously a, a, a major major application area of our technology, but I, I didn't know if that was a question. Uh, that's where our camera come in. 
um, next question is, what is the process of assessing a new site, and what is the typical time to get a system set up after a customer initially contacts you? So the first step in designing a system like this is to get a good handle on what is the current irrigation design along with the topology of the site. So what you basically want to do is uh, convey to us a typically a good format is the KMC format, the Google Earth format, where you basically illustrate on Google Earth where are your different uh, assets, that be the pump and the different valves you want to control. It's typically the pump station and the valves you want to control, or the manifolds you want to control, how many valves at each manifold, and again indicated on sort of a Google Earth format. The reason that is a good way to do it is because then we can go in and look at obviously what equipment will be necessary, but we can also gauge using Google Earth as a tool we can gauge the wireless, uh, cap wireless capabilities that we need to solve the problem and have reliable wireless uh, communication. So once you get that into your, your reseller or to us, then we will take a, take a look at that and we will design a system. And uh, once you have verified and, uh, and approved that, you know, that basically comes down to approving uh, the quote that comes out of it, then we typically have about uh, two weeks uh, from uh, confirmed quote and, and, and you know, down payment on the order to, to we can ship an order. Uh, that's just a general guideline. Sometimes of year, obviously, very busy. Uh, it takes a little bit longer time. Some, some times of year is less busy, and then we can do it quicker than that. But I think uh, two weeks is a good good uh, assessment. It also depends a little bit on whether you uh, the particular reseller that is in your area, how busy they are, of course, uh, that, that also affects it. But in terms of uh, system manufacturing from our factory, it's typically uh, about, about two weeks. Um, to, uh, we have uh, one other question here, but maybe I think this is a, a good time to, can you show the uh, uh, slide with our uh, at the end of the presentation with our contact information. Oh, yeah. If uh, any of you are uh, uh, interested in, uh, in uh, a site evaluation or just want to talk with us more, you, know, you could uh, reach us uh, by email or by phone. Um, with that phone number, if you just uh, dial extension 1, uh, you'll get the uh, Jay Brown or sales manager. Let's see, so. Um, there's a question here, and I'm not sure I'm going to, uh, I understand it, but um, I'll, I'll give it a uh, try. Perhaps a quick question to uh, system security. I'm not, sure. I'm not sure what that means exactly, but um, uh, whether it's uh, related to theft or the security of, uh, of our uh, online software, I'm, I'm not. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, it is related to our uh, uh, online uh, software. So it's a uh, our passwords uh, easily changed. So it just uh, relates to the, the to the soft security of the use of the system. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so uh, obviously our service is, is running over uh, HTTP, meaning that it's a secure site similar to online banking, and and uh, it requires uh, password and the passwords that we generate automatically are, are quite random and obviously that's a big part of security. You can change the passwords. Of course, if you choose a very simple password, you reduce the security. So we encourage people to choose, choose uh, you know, sort of non-trivial passwords. But provided that, then the access to the system is, uh, is, is very secure, similar to online banking, basically. Uh, the other aspect of security, of course, is what uh, rights you assign to different users. It's possible for us uh, to give out uh, as many user accounts as you like. By the way, there's no extra charge for, for adding extra accounts. And that means that different people uh, in your team can have different access rights. So those who don't need to be able to turn valves on off, for example, they can have, they cannot have that right. But they can still go in and look at what happened on site or monitor the weather station that you may have there and so on and so forth. So, 
you can, uh, and some people may not be able to, to create rules or change rules. So by giving you the kinds of user accounts that are tailored to each person, you can also increase your security because really only those people who need to do something have the ability to do it with their login. Okay. Um, one last question would be if there are screenshots from mobile devices or is it just websites? Okay, so we don't have here. It's a it's a great uh, question. What is sometimes a little bit difficult to show the mobile site on a screen, but I can actually. Uh, I think it's a great thing to uh, add in here. And so what I will just do is use a web browser here um, to illustrate what it looks like on a mobile device. I think most people will be able to imagine. What it looks like, what I typically do is I make it look a little bit like an iPhone. So if you imagine you're on an iPhone, this is sort of what it would look like. You type in your username and uh, your password. And then uh, it's, it, it's a slide kind of format where you're really more touching the screen than anything else. You see it remembered that I was logged into Sonatera. And uh, I can then go in and see my son status right now in block one, for example, or let's go look at old olives, uh, old olives, water flow. I can see just the same information we saw uh, before that I was irrigated on the 22nd, and you can zoom in as much as you like. Yeah, this is all done with by sliding your finger, of course, in the real world. And uh, you can go back here, and uh, you could also go into some status. You know, maybe in Old Olive you wanted to uh, irrigate right now. You click here, and uh, you can immediately select uh, open, and then and a number of uh, minutes, 60 minutes of irrigation, and then you can request that change. Now, it won't actually happen uh, until it, it confirms a round trip to that radio node, and, and it'll show you here, I, I obviously don't want to open uh, the live system yet, I don't want to open the valve, but what you'll see is it will it'll keep upgrading, updating until it actually confirms positive that the valve is open, which is can be a, a minute or two. So you get positive confirmation when you click here, request change, you get positive confirmation when it's done. And this, this interface also has things like the cameras, you want to see what it looks like right now, you can you bring that right up. Uh, so, sort of the key features from the from the online app is is available here. Let's see here. Oops. So it um, doesn't work exactly like on a mobile device, but so we also have the dashboard here where you can go in and see what's my temperature right now. So all the different things you see the different temperatures, and uh, you can see the the, the Magenta here is actually the frost node, and you can clearly see why that's the frost node. If you zoom in here, boom, you can see how much colder it is down there at the frost location. So that's just a brief view of uh, of the mobile application. I uh, hope that that helps. Well, I think that's uh, the end of our questions. So there's still a, a few people uh, um, still online. Uh, we thank you for uh, attending. Uh, and again, if uh, we could be of a help to you, don't hesitate to, to call us. Thanks for uh, joining us again for our webinar on irrigation control.